Welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's show is brought to you by Herman Marshall Whiskey, Dallas County's first distillery of handcrafted award-winning small batch whiskey, patiently aged in new white oak barrels in the great state of Texas. Built from the grain up, just like good whiskey and better friends should be. They have a bourbon, a rye, and a blend, and they are also building a brand new facility that should be opening sometime this spring, so you guys get a chance to check it out. Please do so, because this is some good stuff, especially this time of year with the cold weather. Nothing better than a little bit of warm whiskey. And welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's guest is a good friend of mine, the son of a former major league player he got to the big leagues but he took a little bit different route and we will i'm looking forward to having this discussion with him because i'm sure he has some pretty good stories about his time at the major league level mr victor rojas victor how are you today sir good man gee how you doing buddy man it has been a while hasn't it it really has it really has man it's uh we've had a chance to kind of exchange texts back and forth here and there but uh it's it's been a while since we actually hung out you look good man you look like you're in playing shape no uh -uh. softballs and golf balls is all i can hit nowadays (laughs) i've tried you know the the men's leagues that are around guys are always asking hey do you want to come out and play no i just i can't i know fry's out there doing doing this thing i think ollie's doing it a little bit uh kenny rogers does i think drees does a little bit but man there is no way i'm going out there and trying to do that again i know my limitations yeah. And I just, like I said, I'll just sit back and, just, and and watch because, right, our time in the sun is over with. So I'm sure um, you look like you probably could, though. You get out there and play uh, at all? No, nah, man. I, my knees are shot. I uh, My son was playing tennis for a long period of time, up and through his freshman year of high school. And so I was kind of, I played as a junior. Uh, and then I hadn't played until he got really into it along with my daughter. And because of that, you know, the competitive juices started flowing. So I started playing in tournaments and stuff like that. But that's been three years now. And that that court just crushed my legs. Even It just sped up the process. I'm eventually going to have to get my right knee done uh, already. So I, I guess that's what happens. You get to 55 plus and uh, you start to break down big time. Yeah, we don't we don't think about that when we're 20 years old, what our body's going to no. feel like. Right. And and that especially no. on those courts where there's nothing to give as far as you know, the shock absorption from your knees. Um, I went out the other day to one of those chicken and pickle places. Yeah, and did that. And so, and there's no way I, I'm better off just standing idle in one spot, almost like just if ping pong's probably the best thing I can just stand there and do this because you're right. I'm, I'm probably going to need a left knee at some point for just from the wear and tear. But yeah, uh, if, if pickleball had, had been a thing, like it had blown up the way it is now, like three, four years ago, it would have been perfect timing for me, even five years ago, had I just jumped into it then. Because I, I'm a, I, I like the net. I like volleying. I, I, got, I still have pretty decent hands. My hand-eye coordination is pretty good. And I, in playing doubles, I love playing close to the net. So pickleball would have really suited me and probably would have saved me um, from, from especially the lower body. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I had one speed. Uh, to this day, I still have one speed. I could never just throttle down because it's just a silly tournament. If I'm in doing something, I did it 100%. And it's like... I probably tore my hamstring one time, and uh, it's just I'm a mess. I'm a mess. You're right because it's the, it's a smaller court, and you are playing doubles. It's you just stand there and move your hands back and forth yeah. doing it. So, but maybe yeah. that's why they have serve alcohol while they're out there because <laughs> of so that kind of just gets gets through all that. So I mean, the one we we went to the one at Grapevine, and it is it's massive, and I'm sure the amount of alcohol that goes through there because people get out there you know you start drinking you get like you said you get the beer muscles you get a little bit of strength you, i feel great and then the next yeah. day you think you're hung over now your body's hung over is what it is <laughs> from, from from doing that yeah. so but you're yeah. right you're like me that you go i only have one speed that's it i'm all i'm all or nothing so and i think right. with kids that that brings it out right they want to because they push us they push our buttons hey let's go play this dad okay and all of a sudden right they'll do a little bit then they'll start chirping, right? And so then yeah. we have to play, <laughs> okay, we have to give them a little bit of a lesson. So maybe we just need a little bit more time to, to get yeah. warmed up before we can get out there. 
We did it yesterday. We were driving back into the neighborhood. We had to go to academy for something, and there's a couple of tennis courts. It was about 6.30 or so, and still twilight, and my son goes, let's go out and play some some tennis. And uh, and I'm driving. I'm like, oh, man, that just does not sound good to me right now. And then I got home. I said, listen, if you could find a can of tennis balls that are still good, I'll go out and hit some balls with you. And he found a can. Those things must have been two, three years old. I mean, you dropped one. It just it just dropped on the ground. It wouldn't even bounce back up. I said, if you go out and buy a can, I'll, I'll go hit with you. And he didn't bother doing it. But I, I, I would go out just because he goes, just let's go volley. There is no just go volley. Uh, and he hadn't played. So, he, like I said, he he played. Uh, he was a varsity tennis player as a freshman and was going to play. He would have been number one on varsity as a sophomore, but decided uh, right after that World Series between the Rays and the Dodgers that he was going to try his hand at baseball. And so he switched over before his sophomore year, or I guess midway through his sophomore year, to play baseball instead of tennis. So he really hasn't picked up. We've got, we must have 20 rackets, 25 rackets just sitting because my daughter, myself, and my son just sitting in the closet. I don't even know if the strings are still good, but it, it, I like the idea of it. I like that he misses it um, to, to the extent he just wants to go out and hit a little bit. I said, just don't go screw up your swing now. Well, I mean, we worked two years to get your swing to this point. Don't, don't screw around. I'm picturing Tom Hanks in The Bachelor. Right, playing tennis with the in, with the in laws, right? Yeah, out there. Yeah. So that's 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 what I picture tennis as. I don't, you know, trying to the volley and back and forth. That just I think it's the baseball player in us that wants to yeah. do that. I don't want to try and we're, we're not about finesse, right? We're about power, trying to yeah. just hit the ball as hard as we can. That or Big Daddy, where you, you know he's hitting the guy in the throat and face. That's what yeah. I would want to do as yeah. as an athlete. Then as a baseball player, it's just it's. It might not be fun to them, but it's fun to me, right? We 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 find the humor in it. It's like dodgeball when we were kids, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the worst the worst players, as far as tennis are concerned, are those uh, little chippy guys that they, 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 they backspin the ball to you or lob, and they just play the long game, right? They just try to wear you out because they know. As, I mean, you know, I'm six two, you know, two fifteen, two twenty. Um, I'd like to think that I'm 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 in pretty good shape. But they see that, and you're playing someone who's, you know, 5'5", five, five and is a little flea. They can just go back and forth. They see that on my end, and they're like, all right, I'll just, I'll just frustrate them, right? Just lob and lob and backspin. And, you know, like you said, it's like, for us, it's like, rah, rah, just try to hit as hard as possible. And they just kind of go, all I got to do is get a racket on and get it back. And it's the most frustrating thing in the world. That's that coupled with the, the wear and tear. And uh, that's why I went to retirement on that end. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, so as a, as a kid, let's, as, as a kid, you know, growing up, your dad playing uh, major league baseball as a kid, were, was baseball just it for you or did you play other sports growing up? We, we played all, all sports. Uh, I grew up with three brothers. So it was four boys in the house plus dads. My poor mom uh, just, <laughs> just crushed. And dad would, by, by the time we got into the eighties, you know, dad was retired and he was traveling, uh, you know, scouting with the Cubs and, and the angels and stuff like that. So it was mom and the four boys, but we played all sports. I mean, my high school season, I grew up in Kansas. And so our high school season was really like 20 games. Uh, that was it. And if you got to the playoffs, you got to the playoffs and then Legion ball in the summertime, you know, that was maybe like a 30 game schedule over the summer and you were, you were done. And then football would start and then basketball, uh, you actually had the, you know, the actual seasons where things were broken up. Uh, for me, I, uh, in, in middle school, I did, I did some track, I did some football and obviously the baseball stuff, you didn't have it in middle school. You, you played summer ball. And then when I got into high school, I wasn't going to make my, my older brother was a senior. I was a freshman. I was not going to make the varsity team. And I really wanted to play with my brother. So I blew off baseball because I was already playing tennis and I played varsity tennis my freshman year. And then went back to baseball, but also played sophomore basketball. And, and, and I just did a little bit of everything. Just, that's just because that's the way we grew up, right? I mean, you know, Saturday mornings at our house, 8 o'clock in the morning, my mom would just basically open the door and say, I'll see you at dinner time. Just let me get out of the house. The, uh, the, the Latin music was on, and she was cleaning the house. And we, we were coming home when, you know, it got dark out. So it's a different animal nowadays. You know, I, like I said, with my son playing tennis and then making the transition to this baseball stuff, like I had no idea 
how intense the summer schedule was, the showcase stuff, the the recruit. I had no clue, Manchi. I had no clue whatsoever. Like I, in my mind, I had just figured out the USTA UTR stuff on the tennis side and was comfortable with it because um, I think Tyler wanted to play in college at that time. And then we made the switch. He plays baseball sophomore year. And I said, after he finished, I said, hey, man, let's just shut it down for the summer. Because uh, you had, you know, it's just your body's not used to baseball schedule and all that stuff. Let's just settle down. And then I started doing some research. I'm like, what in the world? And like, that's, we had to get two summers ago is when we got into summer ball. Like the, that, my first bull ray, I'd heard of perfect game. I've heard of, you know, like five tool, but I didn't know what it was. And uh, what a shock to the system that was. I mean, because it's something that we certainly didn't grow up with, any of that stuff. Yeah, we didn't either. That's you were the same as me growing up 19, 20 games in high school. And then, you know, your the weather changed. You couldn't play like they right. do here. And, and, and going from, you know, having our four seasons, baby, and it's all the same weather. So guys continue to do it. Um, so and on with four brothers, you were second in line. Third. You were third, third. in line. Okay. Yep. So it was, what was the age difference between all of you? So, uh, so my two older brothers are about two years apart. And then between Mike, uh, number two, and myself, there's five years apart. And then my younger brother is a year and a half younger than I am. So, you so it was have- really the, t- the top two, the separation, and, and then the bottom two. And then really the funny part about all that is that Mike and I, two and three, really were the closest you know, as far as the bonding is concerned, and maybe it's because of baseball, he, he you know, he became a minor league, longtime minor league manager. He, he was a coach with the Tigers and a coach with the Mariners. So there was that connection. We were always seeing each other at the ballpark. Um, but you know, all the top three of us played professionally. Uh, my younger brother separated his shoulder in high school, Ouch. and and um, he played a little bit in college, but that was he was pretty much done. So you guys must have had a some really good. As far as, you know, when you get uh, the uneven number of kids, as far as, you know, you got to go zone. So you guys were man-to-man playing. So four of <laughs> you destroying a house, and uh, your dad, and you're traveling. Were you traveling with dad when he was, or were you guys? Uh, so it was your mom basically dealing with four of you going all over the place, trying to deal with this. What? Yeah. Does she, does she, I mean, it's what does she say now as far as having four boys, as far as I'm – the grandkids and everything else. I mean, does she even want to come around anymore? Who would want to come around yeah. having four boys? She doesn't, tra- she doesn't travel much. I mean, uh, I, I asked uh, my mom and dad to come out here um, to, to Dallas to see Tyler play because uh, they started playing their season last week. And my mom's like, ah, I don't feel like traveling. My dad ended up coming <laughs> out. And uh, she's, I think she likes her alone time, to be perfectly honest with you. She's got to deal with dad. Uh, they live down in Naples, Florida. And, uh, but uh, it, it was it was interesting. Uh, my oldest brother Tab graduated in in '79, and Mike graduated in '82. Um, and '82, that's when Dad shifted from the Cubs over to the Angels. So it was really Bobby and I that were at home, um, and so we would travel some. Mike and Tab were already playing minor league ball at that time uh, in the A's system, and so really when the, the summers rolled around, it was just. You know, the focus became me because I was the next in line. Uh, and then Bobby was, you know, just doing his thing as a young kid. But, uh, yeah, my, my poor mom, God bless her soul. I mean, we would go to – I remember traveling to spring training. It was, that was with the Cubs. He retired in 77. 78 through 81, he was a coach with the Cubs. So they – obviously, spring training in Arizona. And living in Kansas, we would pack up the van – and my mom would drive the four boys and we would drive to Arizona for spring training to just go spend some time with my dad out there. And I, you know, I remember her, she had a little Saturday night special gun that she used to carry with a pack with it. Uh, that's when you still had, um, uh, you still had full service gas stations. So when you're on the road, right, you, you just rolled out in your window and she would, I mean, it was like a crack. She wouldn't roll it down. She'd just say, fill it up, you know, regular, and then she would, I'd never forget, she always took the gun because she was protecting us. And she just put her hands on the steering wheel, just kind of holding it right here, right here, and just kind of tell the guy, you know, fill it up regular, uh, just so he knew uh, that, that she was packing. Um, 
and, and and it was it was it was cool. I mean, it was a it was a cool lifestyle. It was it, it was interesting, and the way she's just been able to manage or was able to manage the four boys and get through it, uh, get us out of the house, and then you know be able to travel with dad for a little bit um, was was a lot of fun. And then you know that lasted until ninety two, and then ninety three we had already moved down to South Florida by then. You know, he ended up coaching with the Marlins for a long time, and that worked out. The inaugural, I happened to be there that year with him in '93, and um, but yeah, that she poor woman. There's no wonder she likes her alone time. I'm like, are you sure you don't want to come visit? Tyler's really asking for you. Nah, good. You, you and your dad have fun, and I know why. You're gonna have exactly. to dupe her as far as coming. Hey, no, if it's not for baseball, just come for another reason. I can't imagine. Yeah. What do you think the over under is? The amount of games that she was actually Ooh. at. Uh, throughout i mean you, that might be a record as far as four boys yeah. and a husband to do that i mean it's you should ask her one day did you probably I, I, give her have, a heart attack to sit there and think i mean about. seriously it, it would have to be in the thousands i mean and everyone knew who she was um she didn't mess around uh she knew and knows the game of baseball um and so you could hear her you know from the stands chirping uh, not not negatively like you see in today's world, but just like uh, in a, in a positive sense. Like everyone loved my mom because she was she was the mother hen, and it, and and same went for like when we were at the ballpark at, at Royal Stadium. Uh, all of the wives, you know, kind of gathered around her. She was the one that kind of took everybody in and showed them the ropes and so on and so forth and. Uh, to this day, uh, every time I see uh, Rob Nen's wife, Jindy, who was with the Marlins, uh, she says, and, and they were just recently married when Rob was with the Marlins, tell your mom I said hello, she was the best, she taught me this, taught me that, and there's any number of folks, that are, that's just the way she was, you know, and uh, friends of ours that we grew up in high school, how's your mom doing? Because they just, re dad was never around because he was always traveling, but mom was always at the games, and it was... Uh, it was cool to uh, to kind of be, have her there, uh, and she tried to make it as – and she would bounce around. Uh, and she would try to hit all the different spots, um, ball games. If she was late, she still made it and, and watched as much as possible and interacted with us. And she was the person that we talked baseball to, right, because, you know, periodically we – you know, when Dad was able to make a phone call home, we would talk at night, but on the drive – you know, to go get something to eat or be with the team, she was there and we would discuss the game and it was kind of a cool, cool experience. That's good. Cause you know, sometimes some parents go or, or wives or not go just to, for the social part, she was seemed like she was more into actually learning the game, you know, and that's, I think that's a lost art form nowadays. And I, do you think that had an effect on you going into broadcasting, being able to have those conversations with mom and with dad, or was it just something that, uh, you just woke up one day. This is what I want to do. I think it might be a combination of things. And, and you know, in, in my mom's case, it, it's unique because, you know, my dad and her, you know, they'd known each other for a long time. They grew up together basically in Cuba. And they so they came over when, you know, the revolution happened in, in Cuba and in 50 started in 59. They didn't get out till 60, 61. You know, dad was already signed with the Reds organization and they came over and they, so she was, she was already intertwined in the baseball world at that time. And then, you know, when you're here and you don't speak the language, you don't have any money and your soulmate is, is the only other person you really know, uh, you kind of delve into their life. And that's why she, she really got to know the game of baseball as much as she did in, in New Jersey in, in the minor leagues and, 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 and all from there, as far as the broadcasting thing, no, I think it, it really was just one of those things. I woke up one morning at 32 years of age um, and said, I want to try something new. I had worked in, uh, after playing and do, do the coaching thing, I'd worked in a bunch of different front offices and I enjoyed it, uh, but I wasn't like wholly fulfilled. And I just, God, I just, I, I remember I was working, believe it or not, I, I was doing some consulting. And at the same time, it was Christmas time. I'd just been married to Kim, my, my wife, um, and I decided, well, let me get a job at Christmas time at customer service in Boca Raton, Florida, at Nordstrom. And, uh, and, and I was loving it. It was a good, good company and good people. I enjoyed it. Easy clock in, clock out. It wasn't a, it wasn't a serious thing for me, I, but I enjoyed the work. And I just got this wild hair one day. It's like, I want to, I want to go see if I could try broadcasting. And, um, I remember at the time being 31, 32, 
you know, the old mindset of the athlete is, you know, I have some friends that are now managing independent league teams. I wonder if I can call them and get a job as a player, you know, the 25th guy on the roster so I can make my 800 bucks a month or 900 bucks a month in indie ball. And then in my spare time, go to like the radio station and learn, you know, the business. And, and I learned very quickly that even your friends don't want you as a, as a former player at that age. And uh, I was lucky that I had uh, a buddy of mine who was a third base coach for the Newark Bears at the time. And the Bears were owned by Rick Cerrone, the former Yankee catcher, who's a New Jersey guy, went to Seton Hall and all that stuff. And Tony uh, said, send me your resume and I'll get it to Rick's hands. And, and Rick got it and called me. He said, listen, I don't want you as a player, but why don't you come up and be the assistant GM? You could put the team together. And then uh, in your spare time, you can go up. We already have a radio broadcast, but you can go up and do the, the color on our broadcast because the, uh, the games were being broadcast on Seton Hall's radio station. And I'm like, all right, cool. So both Kim and I moved up there to Newark and she was our office manager. And I was in charge of putting the team together. So the first two guys I signed were friends of mine, Jamie Navarro and Jack Armstrong, guys I knew. They came up. And then all of a sudden I got the call from Jose Canseco that he had been released. I think he was in Angels camp, if I'm not mistaken. And Ozzy, his twin brother, was on the team from the previous year. So I inherited Ozzy. Um, and he said, I'd like to you know, go play with my brother. And so that's when that whole whirlwind happened. We signed Canseco. Then I signed Jim Lair. It's the same, uh, Lance Johnson. And that's where we basically had a big league team in Newark, uh, in 2001. And before the season started, our play by play guy quit because there was a, I think it was Jason Williams, a former NBA basketball player. Uh, if that name sounds familiar, yep. uh, he started, or I guess he got a franchise indoor lacrosse, franchise in in at the Meadowlands there and so Dave the play-by-play -play guy left to go work for them so I became a default play-by-play -play guy with no experience whatsoever <laughs> and I remember being <clears throat> we were in Nashua uh, New Hampshire we were opening the season it was uh, May 4th I think it was May 4th because May 6th was our one-year anniversary of being married. So that's how we spent our one-year anniversary was in Nashua, New Hampshire, playing Butch Hobson's Nashua Pride. And as I'm trying to figure out how to get on the air, I've got ESPN and all this media coverage on the field because I've got all these major leaguers down there that, you know, in, in independent ball in Nashua, New Hampshire. Uh, and it was just a cluster, but that's how I started my, my broadcasting career, that I, I needed a code to be able to dial out, so you, know, you plug in the Comrex system to dial into Seton Hall, but I needed a code to dial out and I couldn't find the code. I had no idea what I was doing. And so that's kind of how my, my broadcasting career started. And a month into the season, our GM got let go and I became the GM. So I was GM <laughs> broadcaster, you know, for a good year plus. And those were always fun too, because when you're doing the game and, you know, it's independent ball, so you got 24 guys on the roster. And, you know, someone gets hurt and you're calling the play by play. You're like, oh, you know, so-and-so got hurt. He's out. He's coming out. And I, in my mind, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, great, now I got to go find a shortstop. You know, how am I going to do this? And it wasn't like the internet was super prevalent. You could just, you know, email guys. You, we used to get the list from uh, of recently released players from the uh, commissioner's office with their contact number or their agent's numbers on it. And it was just, just go down the list and just call people. And, and you'd look up their names on the, uh, what was in the old stats? It was before baseball reference. I think it was like a stats pass thing. And you could look up their stats on there and you're like, ah, oh, good numbers. And then you call the guy, Hey, I'm looking for, uh, I remember what I'm looking for Jackie Rexro. He was a middle infielder. Yep. I remember uh, Rexy. Yeah. Sexy, sexy uh, Rexy. I played with him in the fall league. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he was a former Newark Bear, man. Um, and uh, just guys like that. It was it was fun. I treated it a little like a fantasy team. Um, you know, after that first season, I, I felt really comfortable. We got to the finals that first year. Canseco ended up signing, I think, with the White Sox. So he left. And then uh, I think Larrett signed with the Padres. So he left. And I'm trying to think, maybe Lance Johnson may have gone to the White Sox too, but I don't recall. But anyway, so we finished the season. We got to the finals and we lost. And uh, I let go of our manager. I got rid of 22 of the 24 guys. I kept uh, Pito Ramirez, my catcher, and Joe Mathis, my center fielder. And I built a, a completely new team because we were a very 
it was a power laden team, but they struck out a lot. And on base percentage wasn't very good. Um, and Sounds like today's pretty, game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And so I ended up um, the best trade I ever made. I uh, I knew Butch Hobson loved Lance Johnson, loved the one dog, and uh, so I traded Lance Johnson to the Nashville Pride for a guy named Jimmy Hurst. I don't know if you remember Jimmy. Name sounds Jimmy, vaguely familiar. Big dude, Tigers uh, prospect, 6'5", 250, can run like the wind, big arm, big power. Um, and so I made that trade, and all Jimmy did was go off and win the Triple Crown the next year and we won the championship. He uh, just the sweetest guy in the world. And, and, and I had Danny Clyburn, too. God rest his soul, Danny passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, but Danny Clyburn out of South Carolina, he was part of that team. We had Ryan Miner for a little bit. I know Ryan's going through the some help. LSU issues quarterback, now. correct? Wasn't What's he, that? Wasn't he the LSU quarterback? Uh, Miner? Yeah. I don't know. Who was the quarterback? No, One of those guys was a quarterback. That, we, we had Danny Cannell in okay. my first year. Florida State the quarterback. State guy. Yeah. 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 And then, then he went off to broadcasting career so i guess i followed in danny's footsteps you know from the field to the broadcast booth so you were running uh, the whole gamut then for for a while and then yeah how long did you do the minor that the independent two. ball thing before you moved on to the next gig two years and so like in, in the fall so the first year was 01 that fall i ended up getting connected with mlb.com and I started doing a radio show with Jonathan Mayo, who is now still is the prospects guy for, for .com and, and MLB Network. And so we did a, uh, a show called The Baseball Breakfast that rolled in. It was a morning show. So I would go into New York City to the uh, – uh, yeah, their offices are in Chelsea, uh, .coms is. And so we used to do the show from there. And then I'd, I'd take the train back to Newark, and I'd be back in Newark by like 12.30, 1 o'clock. And then my day would start with the Bears. Um, so I was really fortunate that Rick understood what I wanted to do long term from a broadcasting perspective, and he was very receptive to allow me to do that. Uh, and then midway through my second year in 02, I, I said, I just can't do the, the full GM duties. You need someone that's going to be here all the time. And I still did the player stuff as much as I could. But then I got into I did the 02 uh all-star game in Milwaukee with MLB.com and I was doing the fall league as well. And then in January of 03, um, Rod Allen left the Diamondbacks to go to Detroit to become the television analyst. And so they had an opening on the radio side in Arizona. And the guy who was at my agent at the time was pushing Kevin Kennedy and the skipper was still doing Fox Saturday baseball and the Diamondbacks wanted 162 games out of their radio analyst. And so they wanted someone to be there all the time. And so uh, he sent my stuff. He said, this is a young kid. Well, I wasn't really that young, but young kid, baseball family, knows the game. They listened to my stuff, and the Diamondbacks hired me. So I spent two years in independent ball with the Newark Bears and then got hired by uh, the Diamondbacks. And, you know, three, 20, years, 20 years ago right now is when we were making plans to move, you know, for my first big league gig. It's crazy to think. And, you, and then I just got, I just saw the news, uh, the news yesterday, Greg Schulte, my, my first broadcast partner with the Diamondbacks. Uh, he had some health issues at the end of last year. He's, this is going to be his last year calling games for the Diamondbacks. He's been there since day one for the D-backs. And um, so it, it's, it's crazy to think full circle 20 years ago, I started with Greg and now he's going into his last year uh, of broadcasting Arizona games. Yeah, so you never really wanted to go down the coaching or managerial side of it when you were, when you were in Newark. I or thought that or no, no, I I did so because I had uh, you know I was with the the Marlins uh, as a bullpen catcher in '93. I went down to independent ball in '94 to be a pitching coach for Alan Ashby. Uh, the Texas Louisiana League had started up in '94. Jack Lazorco and Brian uh, Byron Pierce started the the league. Uh, Jack was the commissioner um, and hired me because I knew him from the Angels days. And so I was with Ash down in, in Rio Grande Valley, the White Wings. And I did that. I, I had done it. Like, and, I, and so on the field stuff, and I had interviewed for some jobs with the Expos and stuff like Nardi Contreras was, a, I think, the minor league coordinator for pitching for the Expos at the time. Um, and it just, you know, it, it just didn't feel it. It wasn't in my gut. Now, when I was in Newark and putting the team together, doing that part of it and dealing with agents and players, uh, I enjoyed that. So that first year, 
it was kind of a, a balance, right? Because I really loved the broadcasting thing. And that's why I really had gone up there. But I was starting to like the whole management side of the operations. But I, I may ultimately made the decision when I got the job with .com that I'm, I'm going to stick this out. And worst case, if it doesn't work out, maybe I could, you know, just jump in and um, work in the front office. And I and I and I did have some opportunities. I remember. Um, so I was with Arizona. I'm sorry, I'm jumping around, but I was with Arizona for a year. They gave me a they gave me a one year contract with a mutual option for whatever reason. Um, and the season progressed to where I ended up not only just doing color on the radio broadcast, I started doing some play by play. And then I filled in on TV a couple, a couple times. But one of the unique things that happened in 03 that opened up, I think opened up some avenues for me <clears throat> was the fact that Tom Brenneman had to leave. We were in the middle of a game in Colorado. I think it was Colorado. His wife went into labor. So Tom had to leave and he flew back home. Uh, Polly was giving birth. And so I did the radio broadcast by myself. Greg went over to TV to go fill in. And I forget who was doing the color then on the TV side. So I did play by play by myself on the radio broadcast, which as a minor league broadcaster, everybody does it, right? It's like not that big a deal. You're used to doing three and a half hour games by yourself. Um, the Diamondbacks started thinking, well, wait a second. If, if Tommy is still leaving on weekends to go do Fox, because Brenneman was still doing the Fox games, um, why do, why should we travel somebody and pay somebody to go have two guys on radio, two guys on, on TV, maybe Victor be interested in doing the, TV, the radio broadcast by himself. And they posed that question to me and I said, sure, you know, being, you know, my first year in the big league, you're going to do whatever it takes. Yeah. Um, so my first series was in area in Atlanta and I did the whole series by myself. And when they called me in, in August to pick up my option, um, they said, uh, you know, we'd like for you to do some more of this stuff next year. Would you be open to doing that? And I said, sure, I'm, I'm open to it. I said, but, you know, going forward, do you think I can get something, you know, for the effort? <laughs> a little extra? And uh, they said, well, no, yeah, the contract is already set uh, for next year. But, you know, going forward, we'll we'll uh, we'll discuss it. And I'm like, okay, let me talk it over with my wife. And I never really got around to it because this, we were still in season. So we get into the off season. I start doing my dot com stuff with the fall league, uh, which at the time was only a webcast. So if you wanted to listen to Arizona fall league, you'd have to go to MLB.com and listen to our broadcast. And because I was living in Arizona, it was perfect. And I remember getting a call going into, I was in Mesa to do a game and John Blake of the Rangers called me and asked me if I'd be interested in interviewing for uh, their radio position. Uh, which was uh, interesting. And I said, sure. And so I interviewed, and that's how I got the job with uh, the Texas Rangers um, and ended up getting a three-year deal. And But the funny part is that year one of that three-year deal paid me more. It would have taken me four or five years, uh, the way the Diamondbacks were paying me, to get to that point of, of, of the Rangers. And that's why I made my home in, in Texas in, in 2004. And and continued from there being so you worked with you worked with Eric and Elena or was it I was always no, you know there's no. so there's so many radio guys and everybody I don't know who actually goes together now from you know when we're yeah. playing but you know riding you guys are always on the flights with us and everything else so you know that experience so were you you were with Eric or yeah it was just Nate Dell and I uh, just because I, my last name's Rojas doesn't mean I do Spanish broadcast my Spanish is not. Uh, broadcast quality, unless you want to call it Spanglish, and I can say certain words. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but on the on the English language side, it was it was, it was Eric and I, and uh, I did the middle couple of innings of play by play, um, and it was great. You know, first year with Greg was was awesome because like, you know, it's your first year in the big leagues, like, okay, am I doing this right? I, how, I I didn't know what I was doing. Right, I was just still figuring it out, and then you go work with a guy like Eric who's beyond meticulous uh you look at his scorebook and it is covered with notes and i'm looking at my book and it's like a blank page except just the grid of the the scorebook i'm like well, i'm really doing this wrong and then i try you know it's like i i'm coming to games like in spring training and, and in season with my stuff and i'm like i don't know what the hell i'm doing it's like i'm trying to get all these things in and, and i figured i'm supposed to be doing that because that's what eric's doing um, and I finally, it was like May of that year, I'm like, screw it. I'm just going to do it my way. And that's how I figured out that you, you, it really 
is a unique animal of, 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 of a pr profession because you have to figure out your comfort zone and your lane. I meant you to be perfectly honest with you, I really didn't get to that smooth sailing uh, standpoint, gosh, until about five years into my Angels gig, you know? So just fairly recently, within the last eight, nine years is when I got into that mode of like, okay, I got this figure. So that's about 10 years of, you know, almost 10 years of, of broadcasting before I really got, like, I could just walk into a booth, put on headset, and like, okay, nothing's in my book. All right, that's okay. I, 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 I got the ebbs and flows of a broadcast. I know what's happening on the field. Let's, let's get this thing going. That, it really took me that long to kind of feel that comfortable uh, doing it. But uh, I had a great mentor in, in Eric, and um, I've, had, I've worked with some great people, and I've been very fortunate. I'm sure the conversation with Eric, uh, you know, <clears throat> went in the, the Frick Award for the Hall of Fame in, what, about five, six years ago, correct? You get a chance mm -hmm. to work with a Hall of Famer and, and hearing. But, I, you know, I like the idea you say of – you, f you find your own lane, you know, there's not one right way to do it, but, you know, bouncing stuff off of each other, you know, I'm sure the stories that Eric tells and being able to, you know, to use that in your broadcast as you, after you left Texas going to the angels and being able to do that. Um, is there, is there any, any games or any calls that, that really stand out in your mind that where, you know, everybody has some moments in their sporting careers. Is there any that really stand out to you that just, that, you know, you just, almost are still in all of to this day there's a there's a couple of them and and speaking specifically about eric we had we had sammy sosa on the rangers right and you know sammy was chasing 600 home runs and uh, i remember we were in cincinnati and he hit a i want to say a home run i might have been a grand slam but i'm not positive but for 599 and uh i remember getting on the bus the next day and i had the call uh, and I remember getting on the bus the next day and I was talking to Eric about it and I was thinking about it. I'm like, I'm nobody in this business, right? Like I, I've, I've accomplished absolutely nothing in this business. And, you know, maybe, maybe Eric should get the, the call for number 600. I think that was the biggest thing for me. I'm like, you, you should have the call for number 600. And he got on the bus and I remember telling him, I said, listen, I've been thinking about this. You, you're going to the Hall of Fame eventually. You should have – your voice should be on Sammy's 600 home run call. And he looked at me and he goes, absolutely not. When it happens, it happens, and we'll just let it play out. And we ended up coming home, and, I mean, you talk about just the perfect storm. The Chicago Cubs are in town. Jason Marquis on the mound wearing Sammy Sosa's old number 21. And, uh, you know, I've got the call – uh, in the middle innings and Sammy comes to the plate and he hits the ball into the bullpen in right center field. And it was uh, one of the greatest moments for me at that time to be able to call uh, such a momentous home run. Uh, and it was, it was, it was very cool. And, and Eric was the best. And the one thing I did learn from Eric was he's very emotional guy. So like when, when something happened in a game, he would stand up and, and, and like get into the call and I remember when Sammy hit his home run, I stood up and I punched up. Now, I, I don't know if you ever were in our booths up in the, uh, in the old ballpark, but there's these, we had these glass doors that would swing across this way. Yeah. Um, I, I felt like I almost jumped up in the air and hit the glass above me. That's how <laughs> high I felt. Um, but I got that from Eric. Like I didn't, I didn't know I was allowed to do that. You know, I had to be con con uh, con uh, constrained uh, in my own space with the headset on, but, uh, that, that's the one story that stands out to me. And then I was obviously fortunate enough to call pools was with the angels. Um, I call a couple of no hitters pools was 2000 RBI, 3000 hit 500th home run, 600th home run. Uh, and then the game that I'll never forget for sure is the week after we got home after the all-star break, the, when Tyler Skaggs passed away on July 1st, we were on the road. We played a series against the Rangers, then went down to Houston, hit the all-star break, and then opened at home after the break with the Seattle Mariners. And that Friday night, I remember saying to Mark Gubas, my broadcast partner, um, this Taylor Cole was going to be the opener for that game. I'm like, we're coming off a four-day all-star break, and we have to use an opener. We, we can't just have a regular starter. 
And of course, that was the, the game that Felix Pena came in afterwards, and, and they had the the, the combined no hitter on the night that they honored Tyler Skaggs's memory. And that that to me is still one of those. Uh, you know, Hollywood would have screwed up the script on that one. Uh, it was it was amazing to be a part of, and uh, as it unfolded, I just couldn't believe everything that happened that day. So that that's probably the one game that stands out to me as as the most memorable and and still most impactful for me. Um, and they had handed everybody was wearing number 45 jerseys. They'd given us a couple of the, the jerseys. So we wore them in the broadcast as well. And uh, just uh, just one of those things that I'll never forget. Yeah, the emotion. I remember you remember all that that happening. The emotion, like I said, that you probably felt with th- throughout just the fans that were there and everything else. Um, so, so, so what you know, getting out of broadcasting, I know you went to after you left broadcasting, you went to the right to the Rough Riders. Were you working with the Rough Riders or you know, what, what are you up to now yeah. these days? Nowadays, I'm just, uh, I'm doing a lot of consulting. I'm doing a lot of public speaking. Um, and uh, it's been fun. Uh, you know, my wife had had some health issues for several years uh, prior to my leaving the broadcast booth. And, you know, we, we made our home here in the, in the Metroplex the last eight years. Um, and we were trying to see if there was anything that kept me closer to home. And lo and behold, the Rough Rider situation happened. It was fortunate that it did at the time. I was able to come home, uh, spend time with her. And that summer, she ended up having four different surgeries on her eyes. Um, uh, just a, the, the effects of Graves' disease and Graves' ophthalmopathy. Um, so I'm thankful that it worked out that way. It was hard for me to leave something that I loved, uh, but I did it for the family. And it was, it was the timing couldn't have been perfect. Um, left the Rough Riders in late September. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful that I've, I've been involved with a couple of different projects that have been pretty cool. I spent uh, much of December and January with an investor group looking to buy the Angels. And that was uh, that has opened up so many more different doors that I ever could have imagined uh, with the people involved with that and just in bankers and financial side of things. And it's uh, it's a cool little industry. Um, I dipped my toe back into the broadcast thing. I was a finalist for the Braves job, didn't get it. Um, so I'm kind of in that space right now where I'm looking at all different types of options. My son graduates in May. We're empty nesters after that. We're not tied to the Metroplex. So it's kind of like we're in that move right now. We're like, all right, what's, where do we want to go? What do we want to do next? And it's kind of a, it's kind of a scary space, but it's kind of a cool space as well because I'm not tied to anything and I can go at the drop of a hat. Both of my kids are going to be in Arizona. My daughter goes to Grand Canyon. Tyler's going to go play baseball at Yavapai College in the fall in Prescott. So maybe we go out to Arizona. Maybe we don't. I don't know. We'll see what the future holds, man. I never, uh, you know, you got to keep your head on a swivel as always. Yeah. This, uh, you're also doing a clothing brand. Is that correct? We did uh, started one about four plus years ago, and we sold controlling interest in it uh, two years ago. Um, so I'm still a little bit into it, but I, it, it, where we used to run it out of our house, we don't, we don't do that any longer. Um, so I'm kind of tied to it still a little bit, uh, but not to the extent I was running it on a day-to-day basis. Actually, Kim was the one that was running it on a day-to-day basis. And it was fun. I started that as a, uh, just kind of a entrepreneurial kind of way to teach our kids the business and, uh, had a blast doing it. Big fly was my home run call. We called it big, big fly gear. And it was we would create these graphics that uh, told stories. Since as a broadcaster, you're a storyteller in general, uh, we wanted to create these unique graphics because we didn't have a license to use a player name or likeness um, that told the story of a person, place, and their moment in baseball history revolving around the home run. And um, it was well-received, has been well-received. Uh, the gear is pretty soft. It's pretty cool. And um, the graphics are really cool too. So um Hopefully it uh, continues to do well, and uh, I'll continue to push it uh, as 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 much as I can. Yeah, it looks like as far as just getting back to, uh, you know, you, you take a step away. If the decision you make to get back into broadcasting, do you have that discussion with your wife? You know, you talk about the health issues and stuff. Is that yeah. something you guys both discuss to make sure, you know, being an empty nester, you know, they're still in the payroll, so you've got to figure out what to do. But as far as with her... <laughs> doing that i mean maybe maybe it is going to arizona and who's to say that you know your your buddy over there that's that's leaving is 
maybe he can put the word and just say, hey, to come back in to do it. I mean, w- would you if it was the right position to do it or just you're not gonna, just going to take any job? It has to be the right fit for everybody. Right, right. And, and you know, I'm not I'm not in, a, in this mode where I'm in dire straits and I need to have just any gig to go to be a part of broadcasting. But when we talked about uh, last uh, last October, really towards the end of October, is when we Kim and I talked about it, and we decided at that point, you know what? Let me let, let, let's at least pursue it. Let's see what we can find, and maybe there's something that we can, you know. Uh, be a part of that makes sense. And she was all for it because she was feeling better and things are trending in the right direction. She was very comfortable with me going out and pursuing it. And by the time we got to that decision, we called the angels, obviously. Uh, it just made sense to reach out to them um, because since I had left, they had run through about three or four different individuals um, and, and combinations and it hadn't really worked out. But by the time I had reached out to them, they were already down the road with a couple of guys, Wayne Randazzo, who's a fantastic broadcaster, was with the Mets, uh, ultimately got selected. And I understood that. Like I, I got that after two years of rotating people through that they wanted to finally settle on one individual. And maybe if I'd gotten back to them earlier, it would have worked out uh, in my favor. Um, but look, God works in mysterious ways. And I think as one door closes, another opens. And um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have spent 11 years with the, with the angels. Um, and, um, you know, once the Cardinals thing happened, I knew they were probably going to go with a legacy. Uh, someone had a connection to the Cardinals and I grew up on the other side of the yeah. <laughs> Missouri city. Uh, and then that's why Chip Carey got the job and, but that opened up the Braves thing. And, uh, I felt really comfortable with that and, uh, had great conversations with a lot of individuals in Atlanta. And that would have been an unbelievable opportunity. Uh, but they decided to go in a different direction uh, with a younger uh, broadcaster and uh, someone who did some stuff at Georgia Tech. So there's some familiarity there. Um, but it was good to be kind of in that rat race again. It was it was cool. It was exhilarating. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely open to it. Um, this owner side of things has is, is kind of opened my eyes to the front office again. Uh, and so we'll see how things go, whether it's in, whether it's in baseball sports in general, or, you know, maybe it's not much your side. I don't know. And maybe it's not sports at all. I, you know, I, I really don't know. I'm just going to let it play out. I know that God has a plan for us and however it unveils itself, we'll just, uh, absorb it and, and, and move on from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, looking forward to, to hearing how this story continues, Victor down the road. And, uh, you know, like you said, you get a chance to finally finish finish up the high school here with uh, with your son. And like you said, maybe all roads do lead to Arizona. You get out there and, uh, you know, looking forward to seeing, you know, how the, the clothing brand and, and the Victor Rojas story continues, you know, because I miss those days. You know, as players, we don't really – focusing on on the calls that we hear because we're just so tied into it but you know once you start to hear the voices over when you're watching video and film you start to hear and, and you know you can really pinpoint you know those calls that you talk about big fly as that as you sit here and continue to say it I, you know you can really almost visually see it as we hear, as we would hear it during our calls and we see it on our on our video and stuff so um you know, I appreciate you jumping on here with us today and and uh, and telling us a story because it's it's fun just to to hear different aspects, different ideas, and what people feel and and see and how uh, and how this game changes us. You know, from where we start to where to where we finish. And it sounds like you know you're still you're still writing that that book. And uh, you know, we're looking forward to hearing from it. So, yeah. Um, that how can, you know? So people, with the, as far as the uh, the website for the clothing, is there a website to go to? How can they keep up with with you and and all that? Well, I'm, I'm currently on, on the personal side, crafting the uh, the website and you know, working on that right now. But as far as the clothing, it's bigflygear.com. And um, it's, it's uh, you know, it's a cool little place to, to get some gear. It's good stuff. And uh, you know, hopefully people continue to, to appreciate it. And, you know, I, I appreciate you giving me a chance to you know, talk about just different stories. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's 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 what this is all about. And you're on any other social media stuff? I'm 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 learning as well as I go on there. Just that, just Victor Rojas. That's it. Uh, on Twitter, it's Victor Rojas. On uh, on uh, Instagram, it's Victor Rojas twenty nine. Okay. All right. Well, we appreciate you jumping on here with us today, Victor. And uh, like I said, we'll we'll be in touch. And, and like I said, looking forward to seeing where this where this all ends up. So uh, you know, good luck with everything and. Uh, you know, take care of your wife and kids and everything else, and we'll be in touch, man. I appreciate you jumping on today.
No, I appreciate having me, brother. It's good to see you. It's good to talk to you. And uh, I love talking baseball with you. And you're a good dude, man. I remember, uh, was it, uh, what they t- what, what, you had some sort of street, didn't you? We were in Cleveland. Something about your shoe. Yeah, uh, it, that was the shoes were too small. It was, it was something about the shoe, right? In Cleveland? Yeah, yep. The home run streak. Yeah, it was the shoes were half size too small. Yeah. Yep, I ended up with turf toe from the shoe, stepped on a base in Tampa and popped that second toe out of out of place. Yeah, that wasn't a fun feeling for sure. And then, uh, yeah, the whole – that's what they blamed it on. It was the shoe size, and that's when the home run streak started. So. <laughs> so, love it. Love yep. it. See, those, those are the things that I remember. It's like those funny little things that just pop into my head that I wouldn't have otherwise thought about it. But I'm just sitting here looking at you. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I remember, I remember that shoe thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. It's it's the, these little stories you have that bring up those. I mean, I'm sure when once we get off this, you'll come up and go, "Oh man, I do remember this stuff." And it brings up other other memories and everything else. So maybe we'll have to revisit this in in uh in a few years and, and you know, see where you are and see if you can come up with any other stories. Anytime, my man. So, anytime. I appreciate yeah, you. Absolutely, Victor. We need to get out and play some golf too, so Absolutely. I'm happy to shank it with you anytime. <laughs> It'll be a lot easier on the wheels. That's for sure. So, but I, <laughs> no doubt. Yep. But thank you guys today for listening with Victor and I, and I look forward to seeing everybody again. Thanks.